Good evening and welcome to Pioneer Baptist Church this evening for our Sunday evening service. And we do want to say happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there and all you guys that play the part of father. And uh, man, if you haven't reached out to your dad yet, be sure to do that and wish him a happy Father's Day. I'm thankful for uh, my own father, my father-in-law, uh, grandfathers, and many other played such an important role in my life. And so take just a minute to do that. And again, we just want to honor you today. If you're part of Pioneer, hopefully this morning uh, you received a gift from us. And if you haven't yet, let us know because we'd love to get one into your hands just as a way of uh, celebrating you today. But we do want to welcome you to tonight's Sunday evening service. I've really enjoyed over the last about seven or eight weeks now, we're almost two, min two months into Sunday evening services, have really just enjoyed the format of it with our prayer and praise time, the question and answer time, and then spending some time in God's Word. And we're actually transitioning from one minor prophet to another minor prophet tonight. And so let's go ahead and jump in. And uh, we'll start this morning, uh, this evening with our prayer and praise time. And uh, just had a few new prayer requests uh, that were sent in uh, that we want to make you aware of. And obviously some of the same old ones we've been praying for as well. Continue to pray for Brenda Shoup as uh, she's been um, recovering from uh, her heart uh, uh, um, procedure, but is going to be having eye surgery probably coming up here pretty soon. We've been talking about that to have a cyst removed, so pray for her as she has that coming up. That's uh, Ted and Janice Hensley's daughter, if you're not sure who uh, that is. Uh, continue to pray for George Mitchell as well, as he's going to be finishing up one of his uh, jobs here in a little while, and then going into some CDL training uh, and uh, hopefully getting a CDL and then uh, looking for a job on that end. We want to pray for him as well. Uh, pray for Beverly Lamb's sister. Um, her name is Ruth, and I got this email from Beverly uh, this week. Her sister had been recovering from a, a minor uh, stroke. She called me, and, or I called her, and we talked about that, and it seemed like things were progressing along well. She was recovering, and then she said in the email, she said, sometimes Sunday night, to Monday morning, she had another stroke. Uh, she was taken to the emergency room, and they found she had a three millimeter bleed on her brain. Uh, she was in intensive care, and sometimes between sometime between Monday and Tuesday, she had another stroke, and they found a two millimeter bleed in a different place on her brain. Uh, since she probably couldn't stand surgery, uh, they were to move her to her daughter's house today and uh, require 24-hour care. And so that's her sister, Beverly Lamb's sister, Ruth. And uh, so pray for them. If I remember correctly, I think they live maybe uh, just west of, outside of maybe uh, uh, Albany or Salem, somewhere out that direction, I believe she said. Um, so pray for her. Uh, her name is Ruth. Uh, continue to pray for, um, believe it or not, still having some tent issues, trying to get that here. Uh, we just want the Lord's done uh, will to be done for that, but just pray that we can get that into our uh, possession to be able to use it soon. Pray for those things. Uh, pray for the church camp out coming out. Uh, the, coming up this week, Wednesday through Saturday. It's always a, a fun time of fellowship. Um, but I think especially this year, it will be just an opportunity for a few of us uh, to get away and enjoy some fellowship together and um, just pray that we're safe and have a good time there. Uh, continue to pray for some unspokens that people have mentioned as well, things they've mentioned to me to pray for, but just don't want uh, public at this time. And there are a few of those out there. Pray for those. And then obviously uh, continue to pray for our country and the situation it's in and uh Boy, it just seems like the year 2020, it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. And um, and so we just want to pray for our country. And um, there's a lot of uh, hurt that needs to be healed. Honestly, there is a lot of sin that needs to be repented of. Uh, there's a lot of people that need to hear about Jesus Christ and the hope uh, that we have in him. And uh, so just continue to pray for our country. And then one uh, praise as well. We were able to talk to Dolores this week. She had her heart procedure earlier this week and uh, was recovering well and returned home. I believe it was on Friday and is recovering well there. Just a couple of weeks of, of, uh, of recovery that she's going to have to get used to. But uh, she, she already said that she was breathing better and felt better. And so we praise the Lord for that. And excited to hear that. 
Um, and so that's one of the praises we want to thank the Lord for as well. Maybe you have other prayer requests or praises that are on your heart and mind. If you do during this time of prayer, I encourage you to pray uh, right there where you are in your living room or wherever you might be watching this uh, tonight. Spend some time in prayer for the things we've just mentioned, um, but maybe also the things that you know about that weren't mentioned here this evening. Let's pray and uh uh, open our service that way. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for an opportunity again to meet together um, and to have this Sunday evening service and for these prayer and praise time to be a part of it. And so, Lord, we do bring these prayer requests to you. We think about some of these medical needs that we have between uh, Brenda uh, recovering from her heart procedure, then probably having the eye surgery to remove the cyst uh, sometime soon, and also Beverly Lamb's sister Ruth, uh, the physical issues there. Uh, Lord, we just give them to you. And Lord, we ask for you to calm their their heart, their spirit during these uh, difficult times. Lord, we ha we pray your hand of healing upon them. And uh, Lord, I pray you'll give the doctors wisdom about what to do and handle how to handle each situation, and that the decisions they make and the things that they prescribe or the things that they do will take care of the physical issues uh, that they have. Uh, Lord, we don't know if there are any spiritual needs there as well. We give those to you as well, and may they may those be uh, known and. Um, and, uh, Lord, we just give those into your hand. Uh, Lord, we think about the tent issue with the church. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you'll just help us to get it into our possession and be able to use it. And it's something we want to use for your honor and for your glory. And you've blessed us with it. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll just guide and direct in that situation. Uh, Lord, we pray for the camp out that's coming up uh, this, this week. I pray you'll make it a time of great Christian fellowship and growth and rest in you. Uh, Lord, we pray for George Mitchell as he's finishing up one job and then he'll be doing some CDL training and looking for another job. Lord, again, we pray that uh, that he'll continue to seek your face and your direction. And Lord, that you'll guide every step uh, along the way and that'll be clear. Lord, we pray for the unspokens, the ones that we don't know about, the people who are wrestling with and dealing with things that uh, are not publicly known. But Lord, you know the details and we give them to you and we ask for you to work your will and way in those things as well. And Lord, right now we pray for our country. Lord, we pray for those that are in places uh, that need to make important decisions. Lord, we pray for wisdom from on high. Lord, we, we pray for uh, for uh, those that are uh, sent out to uh, provide uh, safety and justice. I think about our police officers and those kinds of things. Lord, we pray a special hedge of protection about, around them and for their safety. We pray for those that have feel felt uh, that they've been undealt with, they've been dealt with unjustly or um, that they've been oppressed in certain ways. And Lord, I pray that in our country uh, that you will heal many of those um, hurts and pains. And Lord, may we turn our eyes to you and realize that you are the answer uh, to our problems. It is not some uh, social aspect. It's not government upheaval. Um, it's not any of those things. Lord, you're the answer. You are the answer that we need. And so, Lord, I pray that we as believers will realize that and live that out and that, uh, Lord, that you'll help us to take the answer, Jesus Christ, to the world. Uh, Lord, we do thank you for the one praise that was mentioned. We thank you for Dolores, that it seems like her uh, her heart procedure has gone well. She's recovering. Lord, we pray that continues in that way, and we thank you for answering that prayer. Lord, we pray your blessings upon our time together tonight, especially as we uh, jump into the book of Joel. And uh, Lord, may you open our eyes and our hearts to what you have for us and do a work in us uh, through our time in your word. And Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, thank you for praying together with me. And I believe with all my heart, God hears those prayers. God cares and God answers. And so we continue to uh, take those things to him. Uh, for tonight's Q&A, there's really just two questions. One uh, for Daniel and I. Daniel tonight is going to answer the question from behind the camera. Part of the reason we're going to do that. Uh, is because a lot of the things that we've been using in this live stream in in the uh, the Pioneer Studio here, we have loaded up in the trailer to use on Sunday mornings. And so it's really difficult for us to now pull them in and out and have all that stuff set up. And so it's a little easier for him not to be on camera. I promise you, I don't have him tied up and gagged back there, you know, or hold him at gunpoint or anything like there, that. He is... He's free, he's loose, he's there, he's ready to go, but it's just a little easier for him to answer from back there. I'll let him answer this question first uh, tonight. That way 
he can uh, turn his focus back to uh, what he's doing. The very first question that is asked, and it's apropos, it's perfect for this weekend, with it being Father's Day, is what is your favorite thing about being a dad? And before Daniel answers, if you're listening uh, and you're a father, um, I'd love to hear your answers as well. So please comment on those things. What's your favorite thing about being a dad? Or maybe you're not a father, uh, and maybe even if you are, maybe there are things about your dad that you appreciated. And so put those in the comment section. We'd love to see those things and read them. But I'm going to turn it over to Daniel. Daniel, what is your favorite thing about being a dad? Well, I mean, the it's so many to choose from, right? right? Yes. But uh, um, I really do enjoy uh, watching him grow up, um, Owen. I mean, I only have one son, so um, <laughs> unless I'm talking about Buddy. But mm. yeah. Yeah, that's and, a whole different. Whole different story right there. But anyway, so um, I mean, just watching him grow up, uh, watching him uh, discover new things is always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, um, seeing him be excited about things and, and, uh, it makes me want to work hard to like mm-hmm. surprise him with yep. stuff yep. and, and um, work hard to get him things that um, maybe I didn't have when I was a mm-hmm. kid. Um, because I don't know, as a kid, I mean, sometimes they don't, but a lot of times um, they do really appreciate small things that you do. For sure. Um, time you spend with them mm-hmm. and, and just making them laugh and, yeah. and having a good time. Um, and, uh, so I really enjoyed doing that and having um, that opportunity to do it sure. with him, um, seeing him grow up, uh, um, some of his first words and and all those types of things. Yeah, and, um, I've really enjoyed. So um, I don't know. Uh, my favorite thing about being a dad is <laughs> my son. Yeah. Right. So here's a here's kind of a almost a flip, not a flip side of the question, but like, are there things that and this is a kind of an unfair question to ask, but what are some things that you think Owen really enjoys about you? And it must be funny to have Emily come in here and answer that question, but I won't do that. But like, you know, there's some things you just know, like they love to do that with you as opposed to Emily or as opposed to, like there are things my boys like to do with me more than they like to do. There are a lot more things like to do with Cassie than they like to do with me, but there are certain things that they come to me for. Is there anything like, and I know, again, I know it's different because I have a 13 year old, soon to be 14 year old, an 11 year old and a seven, almost, almost seven year olds. And you know, we have a one year old child here, (laughs) but is there anything like that that stands out to you? Like he, you just know, like he really enjoys doing that with you. Yeah. I mean, two things really um, that I can think of off the top of my head um, is, uh, his tickle times he loves tickle time with me <laughs> yeah. um he and emily can attest to this when i'm tickling him and, and we're having play time um, play time and roughing around and, and everything he'll, sure. he'll laugh a lot more with me sure. doing it right. than with her doing yeah. it. I, don't, I know i'm probably a little bit more rough than sure. with, with right. him yep. than she is and and yep. i know he enjoys that yeah um she's a little bit more cautious mm. and careful but <laughs> yeah. that's the mom side right right yeah and so um i know he really loves uh doing that yeah. Um, with me but uh, he also um something that kind of surprised me was he he always fell asleep easier with me than he ever did mm. with emily uh-huh. um there were nights where um he wouldn't go to sleep with her and he'll cry and cry and cry and i'll go in and he'll be asleep in five minutes maybe you're just more boring than emily that's what i'm thinking um <laughs> I'm kidding and he's like, oh, great, the boring guy. Oh, the boring guy. I'll just go to sleep. Yeah, exactly. He's like, not worth my time. I'm just going to sleep through this. I'm kidding. So, um, but yeah, I, um, she can attest to this as well. I mean, he, he, there's been times where he's definitely wanted me um, yeah. to put him to sleep. And it's easier for me to put him to sleep than her. That's good. Um, Very cool. But those are kind of just the two things yeah. that I think Very he cool. enjoys. Yep. Um, not more. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. We don't want to We don't wanna compare. Anything. Yeah, we do. No. <laughs> there are some things dads are just better at. Oh, yeah. Some things moms are way better. A lot of things. Most oh, yeah. things moms are way better at. It's true. But there are a handful of things that dads just... It's true. Um, they, they, they're, they're good at. Uh, you know, Daniel, as far as I'm concerned, my answer is, you know, even though we are dealing with, you know... Um, you know, one year old versus one, one year old versus three kids that are older. Uh, a lot of the things that he said, I still have uh, the same feelings. Uh, one of the things that came to mind, and, and maybe you had this happen to you, uh, I can remember growing up, my mom saying to me a lot, um, 
you, you'll never understand how much I love you until you have your own kids. Like the, she would say, like, it's it's a different love. You love me. I love you. You know, and then you'll have a, a, a love for your spouse and all those things. But what you'll have for your children will be different than, you know, any other kind of love that uh, you have. And it's 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 so true. And and part of me, I feel like a little bit more uh, being a father, you understand the love of God a little bit more. Um, and, and and that's not a slide on anybody who's not a parent. I just you feel like there's a different angle to love that you get through that. Um and so that's been really neat seeing that grow and develop. Uh, one of the things that I've uh, enjoyed doing is is watching them learn and watching them grow and watching them blossom, especially now like Gabe is getting, he's 13. He's, you know, I was telling Cassie the other day, I was like, in, in just about uh, a little bit more than a year from now, we'll be talking about Gabe getting a driver's permit, you know, and, and it's right blows your mind i mean the kid can't even walk up the stairs uh you know without tripping or walk down the stairs and i know he's probably watching this yes i can and he'll argue with it but um (laughs) but but you know talking about those kinds of things and just watching them blossom into with different personalities and different uh traits and different things watching them blossom into the young men that god uh, uh has for them but but yeah if you're just talking about like favorite thing to do with my kids i I just love to laugh with them. I love to make them laugh. I love to laugh with them. Uh, one of the things that Daniel said, I, I love to, um, one of the things that changes when you're a parent, especially major holidays, become much less about you and much more about seeing their joy. And that everything is that way. Vacation is that way. Holidays are that way. Like the thing that brings me joy is knowing that we've done things that brings them joy. We've gone somewhere and done something. We've had an experience that they've really enjoyed. And, and boy, that's just, it's really exciting to do and to be able to share those experiences with them and then be able to invest in them and to see them take the things that, that you've had together and implement them in their own lives. And, and again, they grow and blossom into the young men that they're becoming uh, has been just a really, really neat thing to watch and, and a, a neat part of be, about being a dad again if you're a father put it in the comment section let us know what your favorite thing about being a dad is or maybe your favorite thing about your dad and uh and we'd love to read those and see those uh throughout the night so please let us know uh the second question we're going to answer tonight uh fairly quickly here uh this question was uh was submitted is the earth flat and and so Daniel back is behind the camera shaking his head. Yes. Uh, yeah, like his backyard is flat. You know, my backyard is flat. <clears throat> my road is flat. Um, I, I, I want to say this first. and I might have it in my notes somewhere. I'm not sure. Um, but if if by this question, do you mean is, is the Earth not a spherical planet? You know, because some people say, well, it's it's not like a sheet, you know, like with four corners or it's not, you know, it's a disc. Or if you're asking, is is the world not a spherical planet? Um, I believe that it is. But I also want to say this because because I thought to myself, is this where do we put this question? Is it a biblical question? You know, those kinds of things, because um, while the Bible speaks to cosmology, it doesn't necessarily seek to to build a cosmology, a, a cosmological framework. You know, that's not what it is. Um, and so that's not one of its intended goals. And so, you know, you have to kind of look through a bunch of the verses in there and try to, you know, try to take things out of it to mean something. And so a lot. this is actually m- much more of a scientific question uh, with a scientific answer than it is a biblical answer, although I will share some Bible with you. Um, you know, even even back to the days of Columbus, because I think people have hijacked even the history around this, but even back to the days of Columbus, people knew and believed that the earth was a sphere. You know, when you read through history, people are like, oh, he did this, you know, Columbus sailed, and they were afraid to go off the edge of the earth and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but if you actually study history, the bigger the bigger argument during the time of Columbus was not whether or not the earth was round, uh, but actually how big big the earth was. And so that's why, you know, Columbus wasn't sure how long it would take him if he went, 
if he just uh, sailed west to get to the Indies. He, you know, they weren't sure how big the world was. Um, and so you know, the idea that, that he was afraid of sailing off the edge of the, of the earth is just historically false. It's not true. Um, but mankind, mankind has claimed that the earth was a globe or a sphere long before you know, the 1950s. Um, it, it's been that way for, for a long time. Um, so, uh, evidence that we have, I believe that the evidence that we do have, uh, and that has been presented appears to side on the fact, uh, with those who believe in a, uh, you know, heliocentric spherical earth. Um, and I believe actually the burden of proof should really fall on, on, um, on the people who say that that's not, um, and so it, it should be on, on flat earthers. And I, I believe both science and to some extent, the Bible are against the idea of, uh, of a flat earth. So, so how do I, how do I, how do I personally come to that conclusion? Um, well, first of all, let's just take the imagery that we have from space. Okay. Now people say, well, that's fabricated. Okay. Well that the, if you're going to make that claim, the burden of proof is on you. All we can do is is show you the imagery uh, that we have. Um, the burden of proof isn't on the person who says, "I've been to space. Here's the picture. Here's what it looks like." Um, you know, I can't really do anything for you uh, on that. Um, and so, but I, but I do think there are some other things, and, and we'll talk about them here in just a minute. I, I do think uh, when we look at the Bible, it is important that the Bible does speak to the earth and even at times makes references to the shape or the size of the earth. Um, and it's important for us to know that uh, that when we, we piece together what the Bible does say about the earth, that context, as we always say, is key. Contact, context is key. And so I believe there are many verses in the Bible that people that are flat earthers use uh, that have been completely taken out of context. Let me give you uh, a couple of them. Uh, Job 38 and verse 14. Uh, some, some people say it is turned as clay to a seal and they stand as garment. And so it says that the earth is like a clay to seal. So you have the clay and then you plant a seal in it and it's flat, right? The, the clay is flattened by the seal. Uh, and so people say, oh, you know, if that's what the earth is, then it's then it's flat like the clay. However, again, context is key. And so let's read the entire thing. Uh, verse 12 says, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. And from the wicked, their light is withholden, and the high, high arm shall be broken. So immediately, when we read Job chapter 38 within its context, we realize that this is a metaphor. Um, he's, he's talking about the dawn literally shaking the earth so that, or not literally, metaphorically, shaking the earth so that evil doers fall out. Has it ever happened? Has it ever literally happened where the dawn grabs the earth, shakes it, and wicked people fall out? No. So it's important for us to understand in the framework that verse 14 is in the middle of something that is metaphorical. Um, it basically, it's saying people who do evil like to do it under the cover of darkness. And so when the light comes, right? Men love darkness rather than light. And when the light comes, it, it kind of shakes away evildoers uh, because they don't want to be exposed by the light. The light reveals what they're doing. Um, and so uh, the metaphor continues uh, in that way. And, uh, and, and when light is shown on it, it begins to take shape like something pressed in a seal. So the Bible saying when light comes on the earth, the earth begins to take shape like when a when clay is stamped with a seal when clay is stamped with a seal you, you get to see what the seal is it takes shape when light comes on the earth the, the the form starts to come out and so it's important for us to understand it uh in its context some people may look at revelation say there's multiple places in revelation where it says the earth has four corners um and so it must be flat uh first of all let's remember there's lots of symbolic imagery in the book of revelation and I think most of us would understand that, that those four corners refer to uh, north, south, east, and west. 
and the problem that a lot of flat earthers have is they'll say, okay, I'll give you uh, that the earth isn't a square. I believe maybe it's a disc. Okay, well then how can you use the revelation passages that talk about it having four corners? Because guess what? A disc doesn't have four corners either. Um, and so, uh, and so you, know, you can kind of throw out that passage as well. Um, but I, I do believe there are many reasons, and we can, I, I just don't have time to go through every passage that flat earthers try to use uh, to make the argument for uh, a flat earth from the Bible. But I, I believe there are many reasons to believe the earth is a sphere. Again, images from space, uh, and I, I'm not much of, a sha- uh, much of a scientist, but you can go and study for, themsel- for themselves. Shadows, um, specifically ones from uh, lunar eclipses where the shadow of the earth is always a circle. Um, because if, if the earth were a disc, then the shadow of the earth would show up at different times as an ellipsis or as an rectangle or just as a line, but no matter what, it's always a circle. So no matter what angle you look at it from, no matter what angle that, it, that lunar eclipse comes from, it's always a circle. Uh, again, you can study some of it yourself, the visibility of stars, how the sun rises and sets, um, I also think it's important to understand that the idea of a flat earth was actually proposed and pushed by two atheists by the name of White and Draper. And they created this idea uh, to, uh, they created this conflict uh, that they said Christians were this way, that the Bible says this. And therefore, Christians are responsible for holding earth back or holding science back. They were saying, oh, the Bible says it's a flat earth and Christians believe that and they're responsible for holding science back. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, one of their arguments was that the Middle Earth, that the, that the Middle Ages, uh, the Middle Ages churches believed in a flat earth. But that was actually not true. Uh, there are other verses um, like Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. Uh, where it says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, the inhabitants thereof as a grasshopper that stretcheth out the the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out of the tent to dwell in. And so, uh, again, people can say, oh, that's a disc that has a dome over it. But again, it has the idea of a a spherical earth there. Uh, Job chapter uh, 26 and, and verse 10 says, He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Um, And again, I'm not much of a scientist, but the verse here teaches that God has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters as the boundaries, the the, the boundary of light and darkness. And so I'm reading some of my notes here because, again, I'm not much of a scientist here. The boundary line between light and darkness is something scientifically that's called a terminator. Uh, And since the light stops at uh, stops or terminates at that line. Uh, someone standing on the Terminator would be experiencing either a sunrise or a sunset, and they're going from day to night or from night to day. And the Terminator is always a circle uh, because the Earth is round. Um, And so I think that's important for us to take into account as well. Uh, I even think about the the account of the flood, um, you know, and and the Bible tells us the waters from the flood covered the highest mountain, uh, on the earth. And so if the earth were flat, wouldn't it have drained off of the edge? People say, oh, that there's, you know, there's ice caps there to hold that in. But if it went above the highest places of, of the earth, wouldn't it have overflowed? Um, instead, I believe it stayed for a year because it was on a sphere that was held, uh, by the laws of gravity. Again, I believe there are many scientific reasons and even biblical reasons that tell us that the earth is a sphere, not flat. And I think the major burden of proof is not on people who believe it's a sphere, um, but on people who say it's not with both scientific evidence and um, and even some from the Bible as well. And so, again, I think it's important also for us to understand that the Bible never sets out to prove a cosmology. So whether you want to look at that as a Bible question or not, it's hard to say. I think that's more... Um, I try to be careful when I say this, but silliness for people to debate um, at other times. And so that's just my opinion. On it. So anyway, any thoughts, Daniel? Snow globe. Snow, snow globe. Right. I agree. Snow globe. Um, 
All right, take your Bibles and go to the book of Joel. Go to the book of Joel, and we are beginning a new uh, sermon series tonight entitled, and you should see it there on your screen, Days Like This. If you say, Pastor, I don't know where Joel is. Give me a second. Okay, your Bible probably at this point on Sunday nights might flop open to Habakkuk since you've been there a couple times. Just find Habakkuk and go back uh, maybe about 20 pages. Or uh, maybe this may be easier. Find Daniel because it's such a big book in uh, in the Old Testament. Find Daniel, then go Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. So you go again, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, it's the next one after that. So maybe find Daniel, then keep going and you'll find it. And I'm just trying to buy you some time here so you can find it. Joel chapter one is where we're going to be. And um, and if I happen to look down, it's just my notes are here. I don't have a podium with me here tonight, but I, I want to refer to my notes. And so I'm excited to be in the book of Joel. The book of Joel is just three chapters, about 80 verses. It's not real long. Uh, the book of Joel is written about 200 years before Habakkuk. And so actually some of what we're going to be dealing with here is the Assyrian uh, conquering of the northern kingdom. But but Joel is 200 years before Habakkuk in the late 9th century BC. And it is a also like Habakkuk, a minor prophet. Now, when I say minor prophet, I think it's important for us to realize that when I say a minor prophet, it's not minor because of its importance. It's not minor because of its message. It's minor because of its length. So many of these, uh, many of these uh, minor prophets are just Habakkuk had three chapters. Uh, Joel has three chapters, as opposed to one of the major prophets like Jeremiah. Jeremiah has 52 chapters. And so minor prophets, are minor, not because they're less important, not because their message doesn't matter as much, but just because of their size. For whatever reason, it does appear that minor prophets seem to be a last resort for preachers to teach or to preach on. And honestly, I'm no exception. As I sit here and think, uh, I'm trying to think even for myself since we've been here for five years at Pioneer almost, uh, Habakkuk and Joel might be the only two minor prophets that I've ever uh, preached on. For whatever reasons, pastors will oftentimes avoid them with the exception of one minor prophet. I'll give you just a minute to think about it. Shouldn't be too hard, but can you maybe again put in the comment section what minor prophet do pastors often preach from? As a matter of fact, uh, it may be preached from just as much, if not more, than any other book of the Old Testament. It is often preached from. It's often referred to. Uh, there is one minor prophet. I'm just again giving you time to think about it. If you haven't yet, it is the book of Jonah. Jonah is a minor prophet. It has four chapters, and it's one that people preach from often. But for whatever reason, these minor prophets are often not preached from uh, uh, as regularly as other books of the Bible. I think there are some reasons for that. I think one of the reasons is it's just easier for us to identify with the New Testament uh, than it is with some of these Old Testament uh, prophets. Um, it, the New Testament is just very practical and more applicable, it seems, in our day and age. Uh, honestly, uh, minor prophets are a little bit more difficult to understand, and they're a little bit more difficult to interpret. And because of that, as a preacher, it makes it a little bit more difficult to communicate. Um, and so uh, so I think those are maybe some of the reasons that we'll avoid, uh, avoid minor prophets, but we don't want to do that. I, I believe that when uh, that we come to know God, again, the Bible is God's revelation of himself. It's his communication to us. And I believe that with each book of the Bible, we come to know God more clearly through his word. And so we need to understand that these minor prophets are important. Now, a few things to note, and I probably should have done this when we went through the book of Habakkuk, because this might have been helpful then as well. But a few things to take into account. First of all, when the prophets are prophesying, they're doing so during a time in Israel's history where there was a divided kingdom. There was, and we, I think we did talk about this with Habakkuk, there's a northern kingdom that has 10 tribes. It's often referred to as Israel during these times. And there's a southern kingdom that has two tribes, and it is usually referred to as by the name Judah. Um, and so uh, also it's important for us to understand when we look at, at prophets that chronologically, if you wanted to go to a, another place in the Bible as a cross-reference uh, chronologically, you could do that by going to First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles. There's usually um, some chapters there that they line up with chronologically. So, for example, the book of Joel. If you want to look chronologically uh, in, those, in those books, what's going on in the book of Joel, you would go to Second Kings 11 and 12. And those things are kind of overlapping. They're happening uh, 
around the same time. Now, the responsibility of a minor prophet was oftentimes to remind the powers that be, uh, the kings that were ruling at that time, that they they weren't free to do whatever they wanted to do. That the the, the prophets were there to meant to to keep them in check uh, and to point the king back to the authority of God and to the authority of God's word uh, and remind them there is an authority that's greater than you, king. There's somebody above you. And so they were also there, though, to proclaim uh, judgment on kings and on people who would not repent and, and obey God and repent from their sins. And so uh, if you ever wonder why there does there, why does there seem to be so much wrath and judgment in, in, in the prophets, that's the reason why. Because they were there to tell these kings, hey, you need to obey God and you need to repent of your sin. And if you don't, these are the things that are coming. Now, specifically... In the book of Joel, there is an emphasis, uh, and the emphasis of his message, uh, a major theme in the book of Joel, is something that is referred to as the day of the Lord. Now, I have a, a definition there for you, and I want you to, to understand this, um, that uh, 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 specifically for the book of Joel, it's not just the day of the Lord, but it's about the people's preparation for for the day of the Lord. And when you read through the book of Joel, uh, the day of the Lord is mentioned no less than 10 times. As I told you before, I think it's 78 verses in the entire book. And so this has happened about every seven or eight verses on average that the, this theme, this idea of the day of the Lord pops up. By way of definition, I have it there for you. The day of the Lord is a great day of wrath and deliverance. It's a great day of wrath for those uh, who fail to turn to God. And it's a great day of deliverance for those who have. Uh, many times when we see it in the Bible, it refers to an eschatological event. In other words, an event that's going to happen in the future, but not always. So it's important for us to understand every time we see the day of the word, the day of the Lord, it's not always talking about an eschatological event. Uh, at times, it can be referring to a present time of judgment. And you'll see that even here. Um, and so it's important for us to understand that concerning the day of the Lord. Uh, even in the book of Joel, we're going to look at tonight. Joel here is giving us talking about a general time of judgment. You'll even see it play out in Joel chapter one. He's talking about a time of judgment that is happening in their present day. However, as is often the case in many of these prophets, uh, even when he is dealing with a present day time of judgment, it is often used as a backdrop for future judgment that the people have yet to see. That's oftentimes the case. But it's important for us to understand that when we see the day of the Lord, it is referring to both a day, great day of wrath for those that have uh, have not turned to the Lord and a great day of liver, del deliverance for those who have. Um, and it often serves as a backdrop to an eschatological event, but it doesn't always refer to an eschatological event. Now that you're thoroughly confused, um, let's jump into a little bit more of the book of Joel, and we'll get into the verses here in just a second. Uh, many people believe that the book of Joel was written as a response to what, in my opinion, are two major problems even today within Christianity. You also saw it with the people of Israel. One of them, one of the major issues is idolatry. We see it throughout the Old Testament all of the time and God judging people and God calling out people on that. But I don't believe that that is what Joel is dealing with here. But that is one major one. That's one that we deal with even today. Again, we don't bow down to little golden statues or wooden statues, but there are things that we put on the throne of our heart that we let control our mind, emotion, and wills and help us uh, make our decisions rather than God. We give it a place in our heart and in our life that only God should have. But that's not what Joel is dealing with, I don't believe here. He's dealing with the other major problem within Christianity. And I believe not just idolatry, but the one he's dealing with here, I believe is the problem of apathy, not idolatry, but apathy, um, a passiveness and a numbness to the work of God in our lives. And God, in his great mercy, in the book of Joel, is trying to get Judah's attention before their apathy infects generations to come. As a matter of fact, look down in, in Joel chapter 1 and verse 3. It says this, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Uh, 
Judah uh, or, or Joel was trying to keep Judah from having apathy uh, creep in from generation to generation to generation. And so he says, guys, tell your children and let them tell their children and their children for the next generation. There was a message when apathy was starting to creep in that Joel wanted the people to know. And it's actually a threefold message. I want to share it with you tonight. First of all, the part of the first part of his message was this, the thing he wanted them to pass down and wanted people to know was this. He was saying this, wake up to the trouble around us. Wake up to the trouble around us. Look in verse two, it says this, it says, hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Has, uh, hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Joel's basically asking this question. Has there, has there, have you ever seen anything like this before? Has anything like this ever happened in our days? Or, or have, has there ever been anything even like this in the, in the past, in the days of our fathers? And, and the, the obvious answer is no. We've never seen anything like this before. Joel's basically saying, would you have ever dreamed that we would see days like this? And God was trying to get their attention, and he was trying to get their attention in a very interesting way. He was trying to get their attention via bugs, locusts. Uh, I, I talked when we were looking at John chapter 3, and Jesus talking to Nicodemus, I talked about how God uh, dealt with complaining via snakes. And I said that, oh man, I can't handle snakes. Uh, if you want to get me to repent in, a, in an instant, uh, you know, have a snake come after me. Now, the rest of my family, they're different. If you want to get them to repent, if you want to get them to get right with God, bugs, especially spiders, man, release those things, uh, casting the boys, they'll get right with the Lord just like that. Whatever it is, Lord, whatever I've done, whatever wrong, I, I apologize, I repent of it, I'll never do it again. God, I promise you just squish this thing. Uh, and, and the Bible says in verse four, it says that which the palm worm or palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten and that which the ca uh, canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Now, I want to say this much. Um, I, I do think there are many pictures in the Old Testament that refer to um, to future events. But if you get caught up and constantly reading the Bible allegorically. Um, you're just in a load of trouble. And so if you're going to sit here and some people say, oh, you know, these were just four kingdoms or four armies and all. I know this much. You say, what was, what was the palmer worm? You ready? Here's, here's deep theolo theology. Ready? The palmer worm was a palmer worm and the locust was a locust and the canker worm was a canker worm and the caterpillar was a caterpillar. Uh, in the time of Joel, um, you know, uh, uh, really what is going on here is these four words, palmer worm, uh, palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar, these were all synonymous for the same kind of locust. And and basically what, what Joel was saying here was, man, these things are making a mess. When, when this wave of them comes in and they destroy this part, and then right after them, the next wave of them come in and destroy this part, and the next wave of them come in and destroy this part, and the next wave of them come in and destroy this part, it's just absolute destruction. They're destroying everything. Verses five through seven says, Awake ye drunkards, a weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it's cut off from your mouth, for a nation has come uh, up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek of teeth, teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, uh, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. He's saying, hey, they've, they've wiped everything out. There's, you're going to see there's a famine in the land, uh, and there's, um, they're destroying all of the food and they're destroying all of the drink. And they've come in like a strong army, just wave after wave. They, they've destroyed the vines. They've destroyed, destroyed the trees all the way to where, uh, all you just see the white of the tree. I mean, it's absolutely destroyed Verses eight, and nine lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering of the uh, and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers, mourn. In other words, even those that are serving the Lord, the priests couldn't even fulfill their jobs. There wasn't enough wood for the offerings. There wasn't enough wine for the offerings. There wasn't enough uh, meat for the offerings. Even they were in trouble. Verses 10 through 13 say this. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husband. How, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley. Because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth. 
the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, also an apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. How, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. He said, it's all just laid waste. The locusts have destroyed everything and everyone is affected. Go back and read. I mean, everybody's affected. No matter what you did, no matter what your agricultural job was, it was affected by these locusts. I mean, it was just all destroyed. And then verse 15, don't worry. I'll come back to verse 14. Verse 15 says this, and there's a vivid description that he just gave. In verse 15, he says, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. He says the day of the Lord is at hand. It's here. It's present. It's right here. It's ready to go. It is now. Verses 16 through 20, it says, Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee. For the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So again, they don't have... The animals don't have any food to eat. They don't have any grass to eat. They don't have any water to drink. I mean, it's an absolute famine. It's as bad as it could be. The locusts have torn up and destroyed everything. And Joel is sitting there and they're going, we've never seen anything like this before. It's, it's never been like this. Our fathers have never seen anything like this before. And as I sit here in America in 2020, I'll tell you this. I understand our issues are not locusts. Now, knock on wood if you want to, right? I, I know some of you are like, hey, Pastor, if you, you know, I'm keeping my eyes on those, you know, killer wasps or whatever they are, you know, up in Washington, you know, next thing, it's just going to be the next thing on the list of 2020. But right now, our major issue is not locust. But indeed, I think we could all agree that our nation is full of trouble. Uh, our nation is full of trouble. Believers have trouble in their heart. Families are full of trouble. Individuals are, are feel full of trouble. And it's unlike, just like in the days of Joel's, it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. And Joel's message in that moment was wake up. Wake up to what is going on around us. Listen, listen we live in a country where we, mil we murder millions of babies a year. We live in a country where in second grade, second grade, my son, Canaan, seven years old, will be going into second grade. And in, in, in public schools around our nation, many of them are being taught that transgenderism is, is, a, is, a, um, is an acceptable lifestyle even at their age, second grade. We've never seen anything like this before. And, and the call is for us to wake up up and for them to wake up to the troubles that are going on around us. You know, so, so many people, uh, so many people have, have put their hope in, in politics. And even in this last election, oh, we got to elect this person in because we have these major Supreme Court uh, you know, openings that are coming and, and okay, oh, wow, praise the Lord. We got these people in these right places. Hey, all you have to do is, is look at the court rulings that were made, uh, you know, just, 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 uh, just last week. And the call is to wake up and make sure that they understand the trouble that is going on around them. Again, the people are becoming apathetic. And the reason, the call for waking up is because when we wake up, then we become serious about God. We become circumspect. We're, well, New Testament word, circumspect or sober. We wake up. So we can become serious about what's in front of us. In verse 13, it says, Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. How you minister to the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. He says, hey, hey, call a prayer vigil. Have a have a 24-hour fast and prayer vigil. And, and, and I'll talk more about that next week when we're in Joel chapter 2. But, but it's important for us to understand that, that this isn't just some kind of action plan to get something from God, but this is about calling out and, and admitting your need for the presence of God in that moment. And in, in verse uh, 14, it says, Sanctify 
by you a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord uh, unto the Lord, uh, and, and so they're saying, "Hey, hey, uh, we we want to we want everybody, not just the priests. We want every person here to come and to, ha- and to to sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly to gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord and cry unto the Lord." This is what they were supposed to do. They become apathetic to the work of God. And listen, I know we need to shield and protect the young minds of our children. I'm not saying they need to know every detail of everything that, that's going on. I'm not saying they need to watch the nine minute video of, you know, George, George Floyd dying. I'm not saying that, but I do think we need to, to, to allow them to understand that, that, that there are some major dangers and some real, uh, you know, spiritual, um, adversaries and things that are going on in our world. And while things look bleak in chapter one, the message as we come to chapter two is you ain't seen anything yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. There's a great day of the Lord coming. But God in his mercy here is using trouble by way of locusts to wake them up and help them to realize that something worse is coming if they don't repent and seek the Lord. And I began to think to myself, what are the things that the Lord is trying to wake us up to in this culture? But that is the call. Wake up. There's trouble around us. Wake up. But there's a second message that we want to look at as well here. And that is this, not only to wake up to the trouble around us, but secondly, to listen up to the word of God. Look in, in Joel chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. The word of the Lord that came to Joel. This is not just the word of Joel. This is the word of the Lord that came to Joel. It was a direct passing on of the word of God, that God said these things. And in days like this, Joel says, we need to listen up to the word of the Lord. In verse two, it says this, hear this, ye old men, and give ear. And basically, in a short section there, he, he basically says the same thing twice. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear. Pay attention. Listen up. Listen carefully. This is for you. It's so important for you to hear it. Old men. Some people say, what does that mean? Is that the elders? Is that the older generation? Who is that? Uh, uh, whoever it is, I think it's important for us to understand today, and listen to me clearly, that we as adults are the guardians of truth. And we must, by example, teach those who are coming behind us to hear and respond to the word of God. Listen up. This is the word of the Lord. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear. You know, in in verse 3, it says this. It says, tell ye your children of it. And that your children tell their children and their children another generation. You know, I, I began to think to myself, you know, many of the examples, as even as I was thinking about, you know, my favorite thing about being a dad, many of the examples that I now emulate and do in my own life were things that I learned from adults in my life. I've shared with you my uh, our, our, our regular schedule or a regular occurrence of praying in the car with my boys on the way to school. Guess what? That's something I learned from my father. Much of the way that I discipline my children, I learned from my father. There are things that I implement in my own spiritual life that I learned from my youth pastor, from my pastor, other people that uh, had uh, some sort of impact on my life. And I began to think to myself, for those children that are coming behind me and the generation that's coming behind me, what do they see and learn from me concerning the word of God? Thirdly, the message is this, pass on the message of God. Number one, number one is to wake up to the trouble around us. Number two is listen up to the word of the Lord. And then number three is pass on the message of God. Again, verse three says this, tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. In other words, keep letting them hear what God is doing. Keep letting them hear what God is saying. You know, we have a great opportunity to pass the word of the Lord onto another generation. But I'll say this, it's not just an opportunity. I would say it's also an obligation. 
It's an obligation. And in, in, in Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7, it says this, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should rise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And I hope that I instill enough of God's word, so much of God's word, into the generation that comes behind us that they can't help but apply it to their own lives and then pass it on. Every generation owes the next generation the truth of God and his word, but that doesn't happen by accident. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens when we're committed to passing it on. So I ask you, are you committed to passing on the word of God? Tell your children. Here, here's the truth. If your children don't hear the truth of God from you, they'll hear a message from somewhere else. And that message will tell them to forget and to ignore God and to trust themselves rather than the Lord. And chapter 2 is a reminder that if you think things are bad now, you ain't seen nothing yet. And the time is short. We don't have much time. Tell your children. Tell them. Tell them. Wake them up to the trouble around us. Listen up to the word of God. And keep passing on the message of God. Why? So that when they see the trouble around them, they're not all flustered and how do we fix this and how do we do this? But as Psalm 78 and verse 7 says, why do we pass on? Why do we do these things? that they might set their hope in God. That in days like this, they might set their hope in God. So let's wake up. Let's wake up to what's going on around us, the reality of what's going on around us. Let's listen up to the word of God. And let's keep passing it on to future generations. Let's close this evening in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the message of Joel. Lord, I pray that we'll learn much through this short, three short weeks together in this minor prophet. May it be beneficial and helpful for us as we try to glorify you with our families, with our lives. May we honor you in that way. Lord, bless us as we go our separate ways this week and to work and all these different other things. Lord, may we be a shining light for you and uh, may we be salt and light to the places we go. May we honor you with our lives. And uh, Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a good evening and have a good rest of the week.